Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Bristow this morning. John completed his undergraduate studies in geology and an MSc in geology at the University of Natal in 1976 and a PhD in geochemistry at the University of Cape Town in 1981. His subject was the geology and origin of the Karoo volcanics preserved in the Lebombo monocline, which stretches down the eastern margin of South Africa. Thereafter, he spent two years on a postdoctoral study of volcanic deposits and processes in the Western United States, based at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. John subsequently pursued a successful career in the local and international minerals exploration and mining industry, primarily in the diamond sector, initially with De Beers, and thereupon in his own business and in junior mining ventures. He now resides in Hermanus with his wife Marilyn, where he and his colleagues of the Overberg Geoscientists Group are spending time highlighting the remarkable geology and its related features, including climate change of the Overberg region here in the Western Cape. The emphasis of the Overberg Geoscientists Group is on taking geology to the people, primarily the youth, in the interest of fostering young talent and geologists of the future. As you may know, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations declared this year the International Year of Glass. And we've presented various lectures on the subject. And since silica is one of the base minerals required in the manufacture of glass, John prepared this lecture. John, thank you very much. And we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Kurt, and good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for making the time to attend this presentation. And thanks to Gert and his U3A team for the excellent um, programs they put on for, for, for U3A. It's um, been a real pleasure to work with U3A um, in, in the course of the last few years. Um, we work closely with them, as, as this presentation will show today. Um, just by way of background, I think many people will probably be aware that um, this year has been declared the year of glass. Um, this extremely important, important um, mineral product um, that we use so extensively in our daily lives from the windows that we look out um, in, of our houses, um, screens for, for um, um, computers and smartphones and all the other applications um, that come with it. So, so today I'm going to do a general presentation on glass stroke silica. Obviously the key component of glass is, is good quality silica. Um, and with that silica, um, we can then go forth and um, prepare and produce um, tons and tons of, of glass, which, as I said a, a bit earlier, um, impacts our daily lives and we'd really struggle without it. So this talk is going to focus on sort of the general background of, of, of silica, but being the, the main component of glass. I'm going to show, you know, an overview of all the many forms of silica, where it comes from, where it's mined, and so forth. And I should also just point out that next week there will be a, a very um, interesting presentation by Stephen Davey, who's again a very smart geologist. He does a lot of work in um, in organizing people's um, permits for mining um, quarries and sand and aggregate in the Western Cape here. He lives in Darling and he will give a presentation focusing on the Cape Flats, which um, particularly an area called Philippi, which some of you will know is, is, is produces really high quality um, silica sand, which is then used for making plate glass, float glass and, and other glass products. So without further ado, let's get on to the presentation. Just a pretty picture here of um, very fine silica needles in, in this mineral specimen, just to show again, a bit of the variability of this, uh, you know, amazing mineral called silica or, or quartz, SiO2 and so forth. Just in terms of structure of the presentation, um, there, there are sort of nine loose um, divisions in this presentation from earth structure and silica and, and where we find silica in the crust, properties of silica, forms of silica, its many uses, where do we find silica deposits that we can mine, silica health challenges, 
interestingly, cosmetic use, uh, uses, um, and then the unsustainable situation that we're seeing around the world, unsustainable situation of um, sand and gravel or aggregate mining, and then the importance of recycling, and, and then the end, and if we have time, we can take a few questions and answers. And very simply, the three slides, images on the right-hand side show the typical sort of sequence I'm gonna to talk to. So we have um, beach sand and dune sands and, and sands like this with ripple marks on them. That's the sort of starting product. And of course, the higher the grade, the cleaner the sand, the better. Um, in the second slide, we have typical uh, mining operation. Um, we don't realize how much um, sand is actually mined in the world today. Um, and, and, and this whole topic, industrial minerals, is I, I have found very fascinating because we hear a great deal about, you know, the big mining companies like Rio and BHP and Anglo-American and the gold companies. But we forget that there's also a, a number of, of very serious mining companies around the world who fo focus on these non-sexy minerals as, as in sand for silica, clay um, and industrial minerals in general. And then obviously the third point there, third slide is just a snapshot of, um, of silica fiber um, that we now use around the world to, to communicate with one another, transmit information at very high speed. So, you know, you go from the raw silica sand at the top to this highly refined um, strands of silica product, product um, as in um, these um, fiber, fiber optics cables which allows us to communicate at great speed across the world. And where, where does um, most of our silica sit and where does it come from? And um, I, I'm going to use the terminology a bit loosely here. So we have, you know, pure silica SI. We have silica um, dioxide, SiO2, which is um, effectively, we loosely refer to as, as, as quartz. And so if I use the, the terminology, but loose, loosely forget me. Um, looking at the cross structure of the earth, which I think most of us geologists will know, we have a, a, a thick molten core and, and mantle, upper mantle and asthenosphere, and then floating on the top of this um, round um, molten earth of ours, or, or molten in the middle, hot and plastic higher up, and then rigid and cold on the crust. And that crust, I guess, on average, um, is about 100 kilometers um, thick. So it's a very thin layer that sort of skates around, a, a thin rigid layer that skates around um, on the underlying hotter and more mobile parts of the mantle and, and deep core. Um, and under mountain chains, obviously that thickness of the crust gets a bit thicker. Um, out in the oceans, um, in, in the mid-ocean ridges and that the, the, the crust, so to speak, is, is rather thinner. Um, so that's just the general setting where most of our silica resides. If we go and look at the composition of the Earth's crust, this is quite an interesting diagram. We'll see there that oxygen, silicon, aluminium and iron comprise about 88% of the, of the mass of the Earth's crust. Silicon, SI, comprises about 28.2% of the Earth's crust. Obviously, it's tied up in in different forms and quartz itself, SiO2, um, equates to about 10% of the mass. So, so those, those minerals on that chart on the right hand side are our sort of most common rock forming um, elements and, and minerals and, and we find them in quite significant abundance. And the important thing to note in all of this, of course, is that um, there are another 90 elements out there that comprise the remaining about 12% of the, of, of the elements that make up um, the rest of the crust. And quite critically, and this is an important one for, for miners and explorers, is that if you take the, 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 the minerals that we typically mine in great abundance, gold, silver, copper, base metals, um, those, those are collectively uh, they comprise less than 0.03% of the crust by mass. And, and, and there's a lesson in there um, which says that, you know, when we come to the situation where we're starting to mine more of these base metals like copper and equally cobalt, lithium, 
rare earths, we, we are now starting to, to mine very rare commodities um, and, and many of them, diamonds being a good example, obviously you start looking at the sort of parts per million and parts per billion um, type situation in terms of the abundance and you've got to move a great deal of rock or whatever the case may be to extract those minerals. So let's not kid ourselves and you know, when it comes to producing all these green minerals or critical minerals that we need to make um, our environment cleaner, um, we're certainly not going to see less mining, we're probably going to see more. If we move on to silica properties, it, it's a very interesting and important mineral for a number of reasons. Um, one of them obviously is the fact that it's transparent. Um, it makes um, nice clean you know, glass that, that we can see through with ease. And there, and there are lots of things that we can do with glass. It has a density that is both you know, relatively high, but um, it's, not, it's not that heavy, which again is important because if you going to use plate glass and, and this um, glass all over big buildings, modern buildings. Many now will have almost, um, you know, whole, whole structures of glass supported in steel and aluminium. You don't want a, a mineral that, you know, becomes so, so heavy that you can't support it up there. The melting point is, is high, but it's not, um, you know, not too high. You can still melt it. Um, you can uh, make plate glass or float, or float glass, um, you know, effectively by by putting um, silica, clean silica, into into a big furnace, heating it up, and then pouring it over tin bar, the bars of tin. So you roll it out over molten bars of tin, um, and that's the way that you know float glass is made. So so it's a very useful, very robust mineral. Um, it's, it's not too heavy, it melts at a high temp temperature, but you can melt it and you can do lots of, of things with that. If we go and look at the geology, most com silica SiO2 is most commonly found as quartz and that comprises, as I said, 10% biomass of the Earth's um, crust. Um, there, there are various <clears throat> forms of um, of silica, um, particularly polymorphs. Um, quartz per se is the only one stable at the Earth's surface, but we do find other uh, metastable um, types of quartz, cosite and stishovite being two, um, around impact structures, for example. And we find um, other high temperature forms such as tritomite and cristobalite from, from silica rich volcanic rocks. And we, we, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide or two. The other important thing is we don't realize that silica actually occurs in many plants, uh, many of our foodstuffs for that matter. Um, the classic one being, being plants such as rice. And, and rice, you know, when you go chewing it and cooking it, you end up um, digesting a fair amount of silica. Um, and of course, um, there, there are many other plants that grazing animals eat or the angulates. And, and that um, those plants also have an, a, a fair amount of silica in them, and that helps their digestive systems. Obviously, the downside of that, it also causes tooth wear. Um, so so the high levels of silica in plants are free, frequently eaten by the herbivores, and, and many of them have developed um, silica in, in their structure, probably as a mechanism against predation. Um, silica, or, or, or rice husk ash is also very useful stuff and that it gets used in filtration systems to make cement and concrete. And then the other thing that also occurs in nature is, is silification in and by cells. And, and it's not my expertise, we're not gonna go into it, but many of these um, remarkable fine structures that we found in the ocean, for example, diatom, diatoms, radiolaria, spicules, and the structure of sponges, the skeletons consist of, of basically silica. Okay, let's start moving on to um, the various forms of silica. Typically, we, we have um, you know, well-known crystalline um, forms of silica, um, which are ubiquitous in nature. If you just look down at the bottom of that slide, um, quartz crystals, you know, very common. Most of us have got a specimen sitting somewhere and then we'll get things like, you know, very colorful tan tangerine quartz. Um, and, and these, you know, these minerals and elements become the building blocks of most of the rocks that we, we see at the Earth's surface here. 
in Hermanus where we live, we've obviously got an abundant of Table Mountain sandstones, um, and they um, comprise this amazing Cape fold, fold belt, that, the belt that we see all around us, and um, and and are very extensive on our on our west coast and here along the southeast coast of of the Cape and all the way up to to KZN. The other side of um, the other forms of silica are the effectively amorphous um, silicas, for example, opal being a, a good example, which is a, a hydrated amorphous form of silica. So it's SiO2 with some water tacked onto it. And, and typically a good example of, of it will be the opals that are mined um, from sort of bugs and, and veins in places like Australia and drive small sort of semi-precious industries. Um, silica glass, um, fascinating stuff. Obsidian, um, commonly found um, around silicic um, volcanoes. Um, glass, the, these glass flows flow and then they solidify and, and form amazing features. Um, um, and and in, certainly in the Western US, um, the Navajo Indians and other indigenous people in other parts of the world as well have, have found um, obsidian very useful in terms of making spearheads or arrow, arrowheads for, for hunting wild animals. And if you go back into archaeological digs and that, um, you know, you'll find these fascinating tools in places in America. And we even see some of them in, um, in, in Southern Africa, I guess, where we've had either you know, silicic volcanic activity and or we've had sort of pure silica which have been used to make um, digging instruments and other hand instruments. Interestingly, interestingly in that picture on the left hand side of the obsidian, obsidian glass is not, <clears throat> not particularly stable at, at the earth's surface. Um, and, and the sort of white flowery spots that you see in there are what we call devitrification. So the glass is starting to effectively devitrify de or crystallize. And, and those will be sort of little um, flowers of cristobalite forming in, in the silica glass. Um, looking at color forms, um, we have some amazing colors, um, rose quartz typically due to trace amounts of titanium iron or manganese, gives you the, the, the pretty rose hues. Um, and then the other interesting one is, is effectively the blue agate and in particular blue lace agate. Um, it's quite rare. I think the, the, the best known and the one of the few sort of classic depo deposits of blue lace agate is in Southern Namibia. Um, there's been a lot of good work done and written up by Duncan Miller on blue lace agate. And very inter interestingly, the color of a blue lace agate is caused by Rayleigh scattering. And, and, it, and it's no different to, you know, why is the sky blue? Well, the way light is, is passed and refracted through our atmosphere to give it a, the blue, bright blue color, particularly if you live on the high felt on a good day, um, it's the same sort of process that gives us the blue of blue lace agate. And moving on, these will all be sort of classic um, um, specimens or examples of specimens known to most geologists, amethyst, the purple um, silica, clear crystalline quartz, uh, quartz is obviously quite common around the world and good specimens still fetch decent prices. Down on the bottom left, we have smoky quartz. Um, smoky quartz is due with, with the sort of brown color, <coughs> excuse me, of, of um, smoky quartz is due to aluminium in the lattice of the silica. And that aluminium with, with the color, with, with um, light rays moving through the, the silica gives you this sort of pretty brown hue. And, and we see a, fil a sort of more filamental growth of silica on the left-hand side. And, and again, a, a, a um, smoky quartz growth. Just if we move on to the many uses and applications of silica, the list is vast. But I, don't, I, don't, I always knew there were lots of applications for, for glass, you know, silica. Um, but when I started looking a bit more and doing the research for this presentation, um, it came home to me just how, how many applications and uses there are for good old um, SI2, you know, silica, and obviously, you know, 
read glass. So, so construction materials, um, aggregate sand, cement, ceramics, all the ones that we, we sort of know of and you know, take for granted every day. Um, glass itself, um, the more important part, and that's really the focus of this presentation. There are literally thousands of uses and applications for glass, starting with float or plate glass for window, sheet glass, laminated safety glass, you can go on and on, laboratory wear bottles, eyeglasses, which most of us more senior people wear today, optical systems, mirrors and prisms. Um, then, then we move into chemically, chemically strengthened glass. Um, the fact that glass is you know, inherently inert and it's quite robust, um, it really takes a very strong hydrofluoric acid to, to etch and dissolve glass. But um, for most part, um, you know, glass, glass windows um, really stand up very well against the elements. <clears throat> but if we look at the strengthened glasses, We'll all know or have heard the word or, or talk of corning glass. Um, very, very robust, um, you know, very, very strong. You can pour boiling water into it, put it on a cold surface and it won't, uh, won't shatter. Then the other increasing use of, of flexible glass is obviously all about fiber optic cable. I, I showed you a picture right at the start of fiber optics in a, in a, a cable. It's extremely pure glass with very few defects for obvious reasons. Um, if we want to transmit data quickly over vast distances, you don't want in, in anything interfering in that glass. Corning have again been the sort of key company who introduced Willow Glass in 2002. Um, it's a flexible glass based on, on borosilicon glass and then other companies followed suit. And down the bottom, you'll see again just a, a couple of names that are familiar: Pyrex and so on, which which are really all forms of, of boron boron silicate borosilicate glass. And obviously, there we move into solar cells, huge um, application and growth these days of um, solar panels um, for you know taking us off the grid, which I think we're all trying to do here in South Africa. Um, so solar panel glass, um, semiconductors for computer microchips, and fiberglass and glass wool. Um, as I said, the, the applications run into you know, effectively thousands. When we look at glass making, um, this um, obviously important process, glass making dates back to at least 6,000 years, long before humans even discovered how to smelt iron. And archaeological evidence suggests that the synthetic glass at that time was the first, you know, synthetic glass was made in Lebanon and coastal areas of North Syria, Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. Um, again, I've always found fascinating the, the artwork um, in, in um, windows, colored windows that we see in many um, churches <clears throat> and cathedrals. Um, aside from the sheer artwork that's gone into that, the, the, um, the, the coloration or the colors are fascinating. And, and, and this again goes back, um, you know, hundreds of years. So um, this is the a picture of the um, um, Basilica of St. Denis near Paris. Some of you have probably been there. Um, one of the earliest uses and examples of extensive colored glass, and this stretches back to the early 13th century, early 13th century architecture, which restored glass from back in the 19th century. So we, we're talking really old periods here where people were already, already using glass extensively in, in buildings. <clears throat> if we just then move on to, to the way we use glass and, and silica and in, in our daily lives, um, this um, very busy diagram shows glass use or silica use um, and and again use of lots of other minerals um, that we rely on um, daily to you know keep the world ticking and keep ourselves and motor cars and so on and, and if you just if you pull out the silica component of what we use um, on a daily and yearly basis um, stats and these are from both the UN and the um, US Geological Survey, United States Geological Survey, 
um, we, we end up, we individuals end up using about six, 6,500 kilograms, six and a half tons of glass um, per annum. So it's not, not an insignificant use of, of silica sand, silica. If we look at um, the situation in, in, our, in our houses and homes and garages and vehicles, again, there's a whole lot of um, red rings there which highlight um, the, where we use silica sand, sand, gravel, aggregate, and concrete right from the foundation all the way through to um, we, it's missing in this case the solar panels that many of us now have installed on our on our homes. So a huge range of uses of silica, and I, I'm, I'm talking now somewhat more about silica. But in, in all of these structures, obviously, glass is a com key component for mirrors and windows and TV screens, cell phones, you name it. Um, you know, windows on vehicles, glasses is there. Then, then we move into you know the big trends. Um, follow Elon Musk. Um, hybrid vehicles. Well, hybrid vehicles again use a large amount of silica um, for particularly glass, but then again a host of other other minerals and um, important minerals and particularly rare minerals. Things like um, lithium for obviously batteries, neodymium magnets for for these super efficient electric motors and so on and and again it comes back to my early point that you know we have to mine all these things they, they they're extremely rare and we have to move lots of dirt to actually extract these um, scarce minerals just to sort of wrap up here again just um, following the earlier slides the many uses of silica or silica glass or glass um, in the left top, um, you'll see the big glass panels on a, on a modern building in the UK. Um, in many cases, you'll use double glazing for um, cold and heat efficiency. And so the, the amount of, of glass, aluminium support, steel structures used in building today is, is, is extensive. Solar panels, um, your, your corning ware or, um, you know, smart, um, tea set that your grandmother had on the right hand side with its glazes and on the bot bottom left hand side um, um, optical glass in in our lenses um, so that we can see what we're reading on the screen computer chips and then another very big use for glass across the world is obviously in um, bunkers and preparing greens on golf courses and and that alone is when you when you look at some of the figures and i don't have reliable figures but the amount of silica sand clean silica sand that is going into golf courses around the world is again substantial and then just to 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 wrap up this um just to look at it on a on a again person base and this this was data from a couple of sources international sources published by raters again Interestingly, the figures correspond with the, the previous one. So we end up using individuals about 18 kilograms per person per day, including in our toothpaste, and we'll come to that. And that equates back to the sort of six and a half tons, 6,500 kilograms per person. Just, just um, as an extension to, to the use of um, sand, and obviously there's a great deal of sand, silica sand, clean sand that goes into cement and, and aggregate and, and building buildings. This is a, again, a very interesting bit of information that I picked up in the research. If you look at China, most of us will be well aware of the development and the building of cities that's happened in China in the last 20 years. And, and in fact, quite recently, but if you look at what China has used in 10 years from 2006 to 2016, they have used um, enough cement, so cement stroke silica, to cover more than 90% of the country's surface area with a one, thick, one, one meter thick layer of cement. And, and I'm just using this as a proxy to also say they would have then also used a huge amount of, of silica sand or sand and aggregate. And if you go and look at comparison of what's been used in the US in the past 115 years, um, orders of magnitude more than, than, than China in terms of the time period, 
China, uh, um, the US in all that period of time, 150 years, has only used about a quarter or a third, third of the amount of, 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 of cement that um, China has used. And it just highlights the massive growth that this command structure, um, you know, so-called so um, um, socialist system has developed in a very short period of time. And for scale down there, is a rep replica on scale of the famous um, Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, which we all you know walk around and think is amazingly big. Well, it is, but you know it pales into in insignificance when you look at the amount of aggregate and sand and cement that's been made in modernizing China. Okay, let's move on. Where where does um, where do we find and and mine silica? Well, um, dune sand along our coast is is a big um, a, a big provider and a big source of, of um, good clean silica sand and very interestingly in this diagram you'll see up on the the northeast Queensland's, Queensland coast of Australia um, at a locality called Cape Flattery uh, north of Cairns and Townsville um, there's there's a couple of big silica mines one of which is owned by Mitsubishi Corporation now you know I always thought that Mitsubishi was a a key um, sort of industrial company. It made motor cars and things like Pajeros and so on. But when you you started getting into the research again, I suddenly found that Mitsubishi um, produces and well mines and produces and ships about three million tons of silica sand every year from the Cape Flattery mine across in Australia. And if you look at their their sort of overall um, the structure of their business units. You'll see the industrial minerals and mineral resources are, are very big in the life of, of Mitsubishi, which when you drill down also produces um, solar panels and um, material for, for cleaning, cleaning water, um, filtration of water, and, and they, they, they involved in many other um, applications, infrastructure applications where, you know, silica sand becomes a key component in lots of the things they do. So this is a picture of the, the, um, the sand that's been accumulated at this Cape Flattery mine, um, ready for shipping. Um, you'll see these big stackers building these heaps um, from, from a conveyor belt system coming from the mines and, and the cleaning plant. Um, the interesting thing about this silica is just how clean and pure it is. And it really is wonderfully clean and almost um, ready to go straight into the, the glass making pro process. So if you look at SiO2 in that um, table on the, on the top right hand side, 99.93% SiO2 with, with extremely low um, impurities of iron, Fe203, aluminium oxide, and, and titanium oxide. And, and that, that stuff is, is, you know, as they say, worth gold, given the fact that it is so clean and you can almost take it from mine to, to glass making. Um, these are just images, again, of the, the shipping um, arrangements to, to move this 3 million tons. There are also other companies that mine sand in the area and ship them off to other parts of the world. But most of the sand here yeah, that Mitsubishi mines will go to Japan and Southeast Asia. Okay, um, again, very interestingly, when you look around the world, um, there, there's some really big, um, large, um, diverse mining companies out there that we don't typically hear you know, mention of a, mention of in, in the sort of world mining space. So most of us, um, um, you know, miners uh, will be used to base metal companies and gold companies, obviously the Rio Tintos, BHP Billitons, um, Ang Anglo-American, um, maybe Newmont Gold, um, Barrick Gold, or typically, you know, the, the, the mining companies we're aware of and sort of talk of, but um, not too many of us will hear, have heard of Emirates, um, which is a French-based company, um, a very large company, it competes, you know, in terms of market cap, and that would be up, up with the biggest. And, and it's, it's all about mining and producing speciality industrial minerals. Um, and and, and that some of their biggest product is quartz, silica, and clays. 
and and we don't realize again just how um, large this whole um, process of mining you know the non-sexy minerals like silica clays and so forth um, how big it is out there in the world given the fact that you know we need lots of it and and if you look at there what they call performance minerals down the bottom there ceramics cosmetics and personal care energy environment energy obviously solar panels um, they, they they use it in preparing food and beverages there's health and pharma pharmacy pharmaceutical applications of silica it gets used in paints and coatings obviously big uses in paper and boarding plastics rubber all all of those um, make use of of silica um, for various reasons okay so that's that's Emirates, um, French based. They have um, mining operations um, in, in numerous countries. Just two examples there show quarries, sand quarries, silica quarries in, in France and, and Sweden. If we move on again, still in Europe, this is um, Sabelco, which again is a very big industrial minerals company. Um, it's, it was founded in 1872 initially supplying silica sand from deposits in Flanders to Belgium's glass producers. Um, if you go back in the history of Belgium, it was a very big producer of sort of speciality glass, colored glass, glass products, you know, way back um, in, in the sort of late 1800s, early 1900s. And some interesting historical pictures on the right there showing old time mining of um, deposits in Flanders um, and, and down below you'll see them also um, extracting sand from, from quarries which are flooded, um, which happens quite commonly. And, and interestingly, that company, Sabelco, you'll see there operates 118 production sites in 31 countries. So it's not, it's not a small Mickey Mouse a company. Um, with a team of over 5,000 people. So, you know, a, a big mining venture, but not one you hear of every day, as we would hear, for example, of BHP or Rio Tinto. Just coming close to home, and I'm not going to steal um, Stephen Davies' thunder. This is a very interesting picture and got some worrying aspects of it uh, on it as well, too. This is in the Cape, um, False Bay. <clears throat> You'll see there just lapping onto the the um, sand dunes down in the south. These are the Macassar dunes, dune field um, in, 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 in the northeast part of False Bay, immediately west of Somerset West. And you'll see there the N, that two is the N2. That's the road that goes from, well, it goes all the way to, <coughs> excuse me, the Eastern Cape, but goes from Somerset West through to Cape Town, Somerset West on the, the right, the east and Cape Town across on the left. Anyway, and the dunes there, um, very interestingly, follow the southeaster. So those dunes, which are trending more or less northwest, have been built over millions of years by the action of the, of the southeasters, which as everyone knows, blow for many months and, and quite hard at times here in the, in the western and southwestern Cape. Um, so I, I just, for interest, went and took some pictures of these dunes, and, and we'll get to that. Um, and in the process, you also realize the amount of sort of un, um, unstoppable um, development of informal settlements uh, on the left-hand side, particularly of that, that road that you see. You've got still quite well-preserved dunes to the southeast, and um, these growing informal settlements um, on the Cape Flats, in this case, sort of Mitchell's Plain. And Stephen's gonna talk um, a lot more about the, the, the Cape Flats and show some images that go back about 84 years um, when this area was almost undeveloped. So the change that's taken place here in effectively a person's lifetime is quite stark and something we should take note of. Okay, so this, this is a, a, a close-up, still a Google image, Google Earth, and I've just um, blown it up and you can see these um, quarries and mining activities. You can see the benches showing there. The, the red star there on the top right is where I, I stood to take the pictures, or, or where I stood to take pictures, not this one, obviously, this is a satellite image. But if we look at this one, you can see here that the scale 
of the mining taking place in these Macassar dunes. So this is an image looking effectively sort of south, southeast into False Bay, which is behind the dune structures there. And you can see the extent of the, the benching on these um, 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 mining faces. And, and in, the, in the middle there, or middle right, you'll see, and there are a couple of them in the pit, and they don't all show that well, are a number of big um, input screens that are being used to effectively um, uh, mine. So they mine the material, um, take it to the input screens, um, screen it and screen it into different size fractions. But, but the extent of mining here is huge and it's not going to stop in a hurry given the sort of influx of um, people on an ongoing basis to the Western Cape and the need for you know, building roads and, and structures um, and it just carries on. Okay, let's move along to, to look at some of the, the other act aspects of, of silica and, you know, Again, all of this, in a sense, relates to glass. But if we, if we um, have to mine um, silica to produce glass and also recover other minerals and elements, um, we end up with with a problem if you're not careful of silicosis. And I think most of us who've lived, grown up in South Africa or been involved in the mining industry are well versed in some of the legacy issues that we have in our mining industry. One of them, obviously, being silicosis. So so Vitz gold mines in particular, deep level mines, certainly in the early years of mining, um, and I guess back then people didn't quite understand the, um, the consequences of silica and the fine dust that, you know, was, was always floating around in these mines. And particularly in the early days, um, drilling and blasting, um, you, never, you never cleared the stopes, you all went and hid around, around the corner behind um, or out of the way of the blasts, um, not, not appreciating that every time you did a blast, there was a tremendous amount of very fine micro sort of granular dust that would have been produced and blew down these stopes and developments and hallways and got into people's lungs. And, and again, in, in the very early years, um, there was, you know, there would be lots of drilling on the, on the face. Um, um, typically in those days, um, you had to clean the hole before you loaded with explosives and you would blow it out with a, with a you know, air, air hose, air, um, blast it out. Um, you know, once silica, silicosis started to be recognized, um, we, we saw the introduction of a lot more water to, to clean stopes and clean holes so you didn't, or you had less of silica floating around. Again, most of you or some of you will have noted in 2019, um, there was a class action um, suit finally, um, I guess, um, completed and um, the mining companies held account for silico silicosis have put at this stage a, a, an amount of money of 5 billion rand aside for treating um, people, old miners, miners with silicosis. Um, also trying to track them down in, in fairly remote areas. Many of the older miners, of course, went back to their, or migrant miners would have gone back to their homes, you know, either in South Africa, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique. Um, tracking these people with silicosis is quite challenging. And um, it, it's, it's a problem that's not going to go away. And, and certainly, I think there are a couple of NGOs that have been set up to try and track track down people and, and, and ensure that they get treatment for silicosis. And it's not a, not a nice disease to have, but effectively destroys your lungs. And I guess eventually, a bit like we saw with some of the extreme forms of COVID, you end up not being able to breathe and, and end up dying. Um, and, and, and I guess there's, there's a lesson here that, um, you know, being aware of occupational health and safety, aspects, silicosis, obviously one of them, um, and other pollutive type situations. I mean, many people will be aware that um, in the anarchy or the rights that we had in July 2021 in KZN, there was a, um, a chemical storage facility that burnt down in Durban North. Um, and, and that facility, again, released really obnoxious 
dangerous um, chemical gases. I think there was also, there was spillage of some of these chemicals that got into the, the water table or, the, or certainly the, the drainages. And I see that one of those sort of catchment dams that was built to contain some of this poisonous material was breached recently in the big floods they had at KZN. And it just begs the question, you know, why in this modern day where we supposedly have good legislation, for example, NEMA, the National Environmental Management Act, we don't have um, proper policing and, and a company like this was allowed to sort of set up in a residential area and house, you know, rather un unpleasant and dangerous chemicals. If we move on to medical and cosmetic applications, um, I'm not an expert in this area by any means, but um, there are quite extensive uses of silica in, in bone repairing devices, for example. You know, the good thing about silica, it's inert, so you can put it, I guess, like titanium that they use in hip joints and knee joints and so on. You can put it into people's bodies and your body doesn't sort of immediately reject it. It also get, gets used in a, in a micro fine microform for drug delivery um, you know many of the drugs particularly cancer drugs and that that they use in your body um, you need something to to deliver or transfer those um, drugs in your in your body and you then need to make sure that it's, it's an inert type of substance the other, the other um, form of, of delivery mechanisms too is to use extremely fine diamonds, which, or, you know, as we know, are, are, are extremely inert. And then good old silica gets used extensively in, in toothpaste. Um, I don't know how many of us realize that, but if you want nice, shiny white teeth, there's a lot more to it than just, um, you know, making a, a, a nice tasting toothpaste. You actually need something in there that's abrasive. So but all silica um, becomes a, a very useful component of your day-to-day -day toothpaste. Um, and abrasives, interestingly, were used in toothpaste um, dating back to over 2000 years ago, where paste mixtures at that stage were once made with bones and ground shells. And you would then sort of make a, a mushy, um, and some of you have done it if you're camping and don't have toothpaste and you want to clean your teeth, you make a sort of nice muddy um, patch and some fine sand and rub it on your teeth and it works quite well. Okay, Let, let's move on and we, we're coming towards the end now, just looking at, at world, worldwide sand and gravel mining, if, whether we want silica glass or, or glass or whether we want uh, solar panels, um, we, we need to mine um, material like silica sand or, or, or silica. Um, if we look at here in South Africa, here, certainly here in the Cape, we have some exceptionally good quality silica in the dunes and, and um, in the Philippi area, which um, um, Stephen is going to talk about up in, in, in Gauteng. Um, certainly the Michalisburg quartz sites and places are mine crushed, um, washed to produce clean silica. There, there's, a, there's a big industry of silica production in Gauteng, obviously for foundries, certainly in the platinum um, industry, there's, there's a big need for, for, for silica, which is used in, in, in foundries, for example, um, and other, other chemical um, applications. So, so around the world, what we're starting to see is that um, there's, there's, there's a huge um, use of sand, gravel and crushed stone. Um, the majority of that would be, you know, siliceous material. Obviously down here, our Cape um, environment has naturally produced silica in the dunes and Gauteng, you're going to, to mill the Michalisburg quartzites to, to produce the same sort of stuff. And you'll see there, sand, gravel and crushed rock that's used and, and um, projected for use into, into the year 2060 is, is substantial. And, and it's becoming, um, or the situation is becoming unsustainable. If you look at the growth of the population and the need for new buildings around the world. And, and the important thing to note there in the first um, bullet is for each ton of cement conc or concrete used, the building industry 
needs about six to seven times more tons of sand. So, so there's a, you know, you can't make cement that works without having a great deal of sand and aggregate in, in that cement. So, so more and more as we build, more and more we find um, that we're running out of, of sort of normal, easy accessible sand and aggregate for this huge um, population growth of ours. And, and there in that um, slide are, again, the, the lists or the, um, the other uses of, of aggregate um, around the world. I mean, obviously asphalt, road pavements, um, cement is used very extensively for certainly creating the, the solid base. And then other sectors like glass and electronics and aeronautics, the use is, is climbing, it's not decreasing. <clears throat> Land reclamation, we're all aware it as, as we sort of um, run out of easily accessible land around, you know, many countries, um, Japan being an example, you reclaim land and to do that, you again need lots of, of sand and aggregate shoreline developments. You know, nowadays, if we really worried about climbing change, climate change, you're obviously going to build um, walls to keep, you know, rising sea level back. Um, so, so there's there's numerous applications and uses for for sand and gravel. And, and the important thing, as I say, is if you look at the slide on the right hand side, which is a bit busy, that um, growth in in the in the in the demand for sand, gravel, and crushed rock aggregates is growing substantially, and and probably in in the real world, not sustainable. Part of the reason being is that, you know, good quality sand, be it, be it, or, or even bad quality sand for that matter, um, you know, doesn't just form overnight. Um, in, in our case, uh, we do here on the Cape have big sand dunes that you can mine, but in other parts of the world, you have to, you know, crush and, and clean aggregate. And, and what we're seeing is if these trends carry on, and we don't change our lifestyles, um, the, the extraction rate is basically much greater than the rate of renewal. I mean, geological processes are ongoing. There is, you know, sand forming on our modern beaches, but that process is, is a geological process and it's actually quite slow. And so if we keep on, you know, mining and building at the rate we do, well, we're gonna run out of easy accessible sand. And then it gets back to the point that we, we tend to sort of shy away from, we're going to have to do more mining to, to um, find the products that, that we need to keep on building buildings to maintain the lifestyle that we have. Just, just for interest, looking around the world, it's quite interesting to see what certain countries are, are doing to start um, addressing um, this sort of unsustainable trend. And, and very interesting, thing, very interestingly, and I think many people on you know here in the audience will probably be aware of that. And if you take a country like Britain, um, they have very strict rules about you know knocking down um, old old buildings or old houses or you know historical buildings that have been there for a long time. Um, you might be able to get approval to modernize the inside, but um, they don't let you sort of readily just, you know, knock down a house in the country or even for that matter, houses, houses in, in the cities. Um, because again, there's a huge amount of effort and cost and gone into that building. So, so recycling um, has to become, you know, more common and, and used um, more extensively. Um, you know, whether it be plastic, it, it's no different. It's the same um, really issue that we should be addressing in terms of, of our, our building structures. And there's no reason, given the technology we have today that we use in, say, mining and crushing rock, that all of this debris that we produce when a house or a, a big high rise or old power station cooling towers get knocked down, you know, all of that stuff, uh, or most of it should certainly be recycled, recrushed and, and used again. And, and the sort of images you see on the right hand side in South Africa, typically what happens to that situation is it all gets picked up and put on the landfill. 
and, th and those landfills in, in this country, many of them are um, effectively already full and they don't have much room for left, left to take up this sort of wasteful waste of uh, material that we simply throw away. So recycling has to be much more important as we go forward and certainly in this country we best start, start taking note of it. Okay then just to, to, to wrap up and um, put a few sort of comments and ideas out there um, and it goes back to, to this magic word you know sustain, sustainability um, if we really really serious about it, um, you know, we need to start making some tough decisions. Obviously, <clears throat> probably one of the key decisions in all of this is re revolves around the change of lifestyle. You know, we we live in this um, uh, throwaway society where we we don't think twice about throwing bottles, um, you know, into the tip or or into the, the into the rubbish bin, and they get carted away and thrown in the landfill. Um, I think some of the some of the wine producing companies, for example, here on the Cape, are reprocessing wine bottles more and more. But they, certainly, if you look around and look at our tip, for example, even here on Hermanus, and things work pretty well here, you still see an enormous amount of material that should be recycled going into the local tips and into the landfill. And we don't have a lot of areas um, to build landfills easy easily here in in the Western Cape. Okay, so you know, can we change our, life, our lifestyle and start addressing it? And I guess that relates to my second point, which is consumer behaviour. You know, how do we change habits? Um, is that possible? Recycling, we've talked about. We see legislation in in the UK driving the process. Um, certainly, something we should be thinking about here. But in all of this, um, it all goes back, I think, certainly to education and information. How do we educate um, people, laypersons, kids um, about the importance of, you know, looking after water, looking after our sand, um, re recycling, and and particularly amongst the underprivileged and poor communities, you know, who are basically looking to survive every day, and they don't really have time to go and you know worry about where you throw a bottle or. Or, or whatever the case may be. Um, related, related to that, obviously, just respect for our environment and whether that sand, water, um, you know, our, our indigenous um, vegetation. Um, I think South Africans in general are, are, are very poor about that. And, and the important thing there, all of these issues, it's not really about <clears throat> today, well, it, it is, but it's, it's more important about 20 and 40 years hence. If we keep on with the population growth that we have and we don't start addressing some of these issues today, the consequences you know, down the road in 20 and 40 years time are going to be quite significant. And I'm not looking to be a doomsayer, but I certainly think um, we should be um, having a good look at this and looking at these situations and starting to do something. Um, a pet topic of mine and be interesting to see if Stephen Davey comments on about comments about it as well. He and I have had a number of discussions about why every municipality should have a geologist and probably also a hydrogeologist in their employee. Um, we we doing things and building buildings and um, allowing people to develop on floodplains or develop housing. And then, of course, shock horror every time there's a flood or a, a extreme weather system like we've just had in Durban a couple of weeks ago. We all glibly, or the politicians glibly, blame um, climate change. Well, you know, fact of the matter is we, we people may be exacerbating climate change a little, but climate change is a cyclical thing. It's happened regularly over millions of years, and it's going to happen again, glacial periods and interglacial periods, we can see it very well documented in the geological record. And, and it's very interesting if we take note of the, the Durban disaster, as I call it, um, recently, where I think it's, we still don't know the final numbers, over 500 people were, were, were killed, sadly, washed away, many of them. Um, that, that whole situation, and, and there's some very good articles published about it by well-informed people and, and good geologists. 
was really an accident waiting to be happen, waiting to happen. And 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 the key thing is that no one took note of um, basic the basic geological properties and conditions that exist in the, in the in the bluff and in the in the bluff sandstones. You know the Berea red sands and and that whole coastal strip on Dur of Durban um, is is geologically an unstable area. And I remember having graduated or done my undergrad work in in KZN or in those days University of Natal Durban, attending lectures by people like Rodney Maud, who um, is, is a well-known or was certainly a very well-known geotechnical geologist um, and spent his most of his career in Natal. Um, you know, helping people design design roads and where buildings could be done and foundation work and so on, telling us very clearly back then that you know the Berea sands or Berea red sands were not particularly stable, and if you allowed them to get wet and slushy, you know they had a habit of of moving from under your feet. So hence hence my reason of saying that you know every municipality nowadays, given the people pressure should have a geologist and a hydrologist, a hydrogeologist and knowledge of their underlying geology, um, you know, whether it's wet or whether it's going to be slushy sand, when it gets wet, it becomes unstable or whether, you know, it's stable. And, and again, why you shouldn't be um, allowing people to, to develop housing and typically it's low cost housing for the poor on, um, on areas below the flood line. So, so that's my, um, but for the day on, on effectively glass stroke silica, um, this fascinating mineral, which is, um, is, is an important part of our geological makeup around this country and, and just a very important mineral and, and a somewhat neglected mineral. Um, so thanks um, to the U3A um, group and Gert for organizing this presentation. And I'll leave it at that, Kurt. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, talking about recycling, surely the mine dumps, particularly around gold mines, can be recycled. And uh, once they're cleaned, the sand be used for silica. Is that so? It, absolutely, Kurt. I mean, I think you I think you spent a lot of your career in Johannesburg, and although you're an engineer, you end up at you ended up at the SABC for a long time. And I certainly remember in my youth many years ago going to visit family in Johannesburg. <clears throat> and excuse me, you drive past rows and rows of dumps, particularly around old mine dumps, particularly around the southern edge of Johannesburg. And most of those dumps today have disappeared. They, they were they were reprocessed um, primarily, so to speak, for the gold still contained within them. And you know, over the years. The technology to recover gold has become better and better and, and more sophisticated. So they were reprocessed, and in the process, um, a lot of the sand that was produced, uh, uh, and, and of course the other element or, or mineral that was also extracted would have been uranium. Um, but but the, the you know the byproduct then was was sand, and a lot of that sand has been used in building, particularly as you know Johannesburg sort of spread to the north. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Obviously, there, there is still um, a big dump, and you'll see it if you take off from um, Oar Tambo Airport and fly down to Durban. There, there's a big um, tailings dump of clean sand. Some of it is is still being used as building sand out on the East Rand. Um, it, it's not that obvious from from the road, or for example, you know, the N3 to to Natal. But you know there is still a big dump, but I think over time, as as this sort of um, growth in our cities carries on, you know that even that big dump will will be used more and more in the building building game. Furthermore, taking a leaf out of your presentation, any sand theoretically can be used for glass making and the and the other products. But I guess the sought after parts is where the sand is clean. Is that correct? Yeah, the most critical thing for making making glass hurt is that the sand has to be extremely clean and and that's the beauty as i say of the sand at philippi that um stephen's going to talk about and you know the 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 mining in in australia at cape 
you know, the clay flattery mine, um, you know, that sand, and, and a lot of it goes back to just geological processes. I mean, we, you know, if you go and look at the dunes um, at Macassar Road, I mean, nature has for millions of years been effectively sifting and refining um, those those dumps or those dunes. And, and of course, you know, you'll understand this, silica being so robust and tough survives, but all the other little particles of, you know, there might've been particles of silica, not silica, but, you know, mica or clay, etc. It, it, it's also, you know, those minerals are also lighter than the silica. And, and they would have been dispersed by the southeaster, which, you know, at times is really extreme. Um, and, and so nature, you know, has effectively produced that remarkably clean silica, but it, it's done it over millions of years. Um, so, yeah, um, we, you know, we have those deposits and, you know, actually we should look after them a bit, you know, a bit more carefully. John, you mentioned obsidian and volcanic glass, but volcanic glass is not transparent. So what happens with silica in glass making that it becomes transparent? Um, well, it, it becomes transparent, Gert, because again, it, it is so clean. I mean, you know, obsidian and, and a lot of these glasses, if you, if you do chemical analyses of, of them, they, they still have, you know, a fairly large amount of iron and aluminium and other uh, mineral components, you know, within that glass. Um, so, um, and, and in fact, some of those glasses, part of the reason that they Devitrify as well is is that they, you know, that they have quite a lot of magnesium, for example. Um, so so there's a there's a range of other elements which give you you know the the different color variations, and it comes back to the fact that ultimately, although that the composition is still, you know, predominantly silicate, it doesn't take a lot, and 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 again that's why, you know, we can produce stained glass. If you think of, um, you know, these gorgeous um, um, glass windows in many churches and, um, and cathedrals and that, you know, and the colors that they use. Well, glass is, is very useful in the sense that you can, you know, easily stain it or use an impurity like iron or aluminium or, or whatever the case may be and, and mix it into, the, into the, the raw glass and it gives you all these wonderful range of colors. So, so, you know, the, 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 the color and the dark darkness of obsidian is, is largely because of A, the way it crystallized quickly, but also given the range of impurities. I guess the crystallography and the geometric structure of the crystal lattices must also be a factor. Yeah, it is. And that's why um, the, the big thing in making, um, successfully making um, you know, durable, long-lasting plate glass. And let me just qualify, I'm not the expert on plate glass or float glass, but, but it's all in the annealing. So, so it's fascinating if you go into these factories and maybe one of these days we should get um, Stephen to arrange that. I think, I think it's, I forget the name here, PG Glass or whoever produced most of our glass in South Africa have a a factory here in, in Cape Town, and they, they have, um, you know, these massive um, baths, um, and I'm talking massive, like, you know, 20 by, by 10 meters of molten tin. And you then have, have a furnace at the back end where you, you melt the, the silica, and then you pour that silica out across the tin bath, and there's the spread this you know thin spread two or three meters they can obviously make it six meters or two meters sorry millimeters not meters if you pardon so you can make this very thin layer of glass it, it lays flat across the 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 bath and then it's effectively driven or pushed out the other side onto rollers um, you know and and there's a whole very carefully controlled cooling process so that 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 piece of glass anneals um, in a very systematic fashion, such that you don't have, you know, I guess, this process of devitrification. So if you don't let that glass anneal properly, it almost begins to crystallize. And I presume that then gives, you know, causes weaknesses in those plates. So, so you know, it looks quite simple, but there's a, there's a fairly sophisticated sort of temperature control 
and 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 the speed of which that piece of glass sort of moves across the tin bath and then out onto you know rollers where where it anneals is all sort of critically timed. Fascinating, amazing. Yeah. John, do you want to talk quickly about the impact of meteoric meteors on sand and silica? Yeah, Kurt, it's quite interesting that um, you know in various parts of the world um, we see meteorite impact structures. You know that the, the simple one would be um, the uh, meteor crater in um, in Arizona uh, on the way you drive past it and you can go and visit it between. I think it's Albuquerque and Flagstaff, as I can remember, and it's just the most amazing um, impact structure. Well, interestingly, around that um, structure, given the impact of a meteor, it wasn't a you know, particularly big one, but it certainly was a significant one. You actually find um, impact um, minerals, well, minerals caused by the impact, like um, cosite. Um, which is a high high pressure, I think I'm correct, form of um, of silica, you know, given that impact. I mean, very interestingly, that in the crater of that impact structure, you also find, you know, very fine diamonds, which again would have formed given this enormous, you know, pressure and sudden um, temperature that that the impact caused. Um, I think I'm also correct in saying, and I'm not the expert, but in the Fredefort structure um, at Fredefort, um, what's it sort of, well, southwest of Johannesburg, you know, people will probably know, the Fredefort structure also shows um, effects of the impact we see of, of, the, of what looks to have been a, a very big meteor meteoritic impact. And around there, we see, um, you know, some very interesting structures related to, to exactly that. So there was a huge burst of energy as this meteorite struck the crust and, and, and then threw out lots of rock material and upturned the, the edges of that um, crater. Um, so, yeah, yeah they're, you know, they're high pressure forms of, of silica. Um, there's, there's, you know, quite an amazing range of different silica types and 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 that's one of the reasons we've been able to put it to so many applications it's a it's a very um versatile mineral if i can call it that and depending how you treat it depending how you heat it um you know you can you can make it into you know many different forms i mean i always find it quite fascinating to, to look at um you know, fiber optics, and you have these miles and miles of cable going around the world, and it's actually just finely stretched silica, but extremely pure silica. Well, of course, the other aspect you haven't touched on is that all of microelectronics depends on silica, because yeah. all chips today yeah. are made of very pure silica structures, and yeah. they have different electrical properties because of the way they are dosed with certain elements that are placed in the silicon. So our whole absolutely. modern electronic industry and technology yeah. is based on silicon. Yeah. No, well, Kurt, I mean, you know, just to look at this um, presentation that we're doing at the moment, you know, if it weren't for, like you say, the chips and the glass screen and the touch screens, and, um, you know, if it weren't for silica, well, we probably, and, 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 and fiber, you know, fiber, optic fiber, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now. And as you know, I mean, We've had lots of these sessions now where you've got people participating from all over the world and it's instantaneous, you know. There's, there's no longer really a lag in, in the communication. It's remarkable. John, thank you very, very much. It's a fascinating subject and thank you for your preparation. But also thank you to you personally for the interest you take in spreading knowledge about geology to people around us and making it an accessible science. Thank you very much and all the best to you. Thanks, Kurt, and good luck to you and the U3A team. You're doing great work. Keep it up.